In the previous video we looked at the structure and bonding of elements and in section 1.3 we're going to be looking at the structure and bonding in compounds. The first learning outcome is that you should be able to explain the difference between ionic and covalent bonding in terms of electronegativity values. Now you find your electronegativity values in the data booklet and here we're looking at uh, the difference in the electronegativity values between the two atoms involved in the bond starting at zero, no difference, to increasing. So at one extreme you could get a situation where there's no difference in the electronegativity of the two atoms. So in this case nitrogen is exactly 3 and chlorine is exactly 3 so there's no difference in the electronegativity so that means that the electrons will be very equally shared the pair of electrons in this covalent bond will be equally shared between the two atoms and this gives rise to a pure covalent bond and it means the molecule will be non-polar. Of course this is also what you get when it's uh, a molecule of an element H2N2, O2 etc. The two atoms will have the exact same electronegativity and you get a non-polar molecule through a pure covalent bond. As the difference in electronegativity increases so carbon I think is 2.2 chlorine 3.0 so there is a small difference in electronegativity there uh, so the electrons have got a greater attraction to the chlorine than to the carbon remember electronegativity is the attraction the atom has for the bonding electrons so the electrons are not equally shared they tend to be closer to the chlorine than the carbon. So this gives rise to a polar covalent bond. In OH, I uh, need to check the electronegativity of oxygen. It's uh, 3.5. And hydrogen is 2.2. .2. So there's an even bigger difference in the electronegativity between the O and the H than there was between the C and the Cl. So again, the electrons will go to the more electronegative atom, which is a hydrogen. So it'll be a wee bit more extreme. So this would be a very polar bond. It'll still be a polar bond, but very polar covalent. And then eventually if you get a very large difference between the electronegativities, uh, sodium is 0 0.9 and chlorine is 3.0, you get to a stage where they don't actually share the pair of electrons anymore. The electrons just go to the chlorine giving that a negative charge and leaving the sodium positively charged. So eventually you get to ionic which is just a very, 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 very extreme, uh, extremely polar bond. Okay, so whether or not you've got pure covalent, polar covalent or ionic depends on the difference in the electronegativities of the two atoms involved in the bond. Next, it says you should identify a molecule as being polar or non-polar and know how to represent this on a diagram. So, if you get HCl, which we saw in the last slide was polar, hydrogen was 2.2, yep. and chlorine was 3, so the electrons, the shared pair of electrons are going to hang around the chlorine more than the hydrogen, so that means the way we show this in a diagram is by putting this delta plus and delta minus. The delta minus goes on the more electronegative atom 
and the delta plus goes on the less electronegative atom. I can use the shapes of molecules to predict whether they are polar or non-polar. Okay, so in order for a molecule to be polar, firstly it must have polar bonds and usually if it's got polar bonds it will be polar. We'll look at a couple of exceptions. Right, firstly, nitrogen chloride. It's non-polar. Okay. Why is it non-polar? Well, the first thing you check, does it have polar bonds? It doesn't have polar bonds. Nitrogen and chlorine both have the same electronegativity, three. So these are pure covalent bonds, non-polar. Okay. Right. Let's assume you do have polar bonds. The basic assumption would be if there's polar bonds in the molecule, the molecule will be polar. The exception are if you've got a perfectly tetrahedral molecule and you normally come across this in the form of carbon with its four bonds. If the four bonds, now all four of these bonds are polar, carbon and chlorine have different electronegativities. But because all four bonds are symmetrically arranged around the carbon atom and are pulling in different directions, uh, despite the fact that it's got polar bonds, they've all pulled in different directions, so the molecule is non-polar. So, oops. So, uh, so this has got polar bonds. but it's a non-polar molecule. So that's the main exception to look out for when you have these four identical bonds coming off a carbon. Even though they're polar, they'll cancel each other out. Now just watch out for this example here. All the bonds here are polar, but they don't cancel out because all four bonds are not identical. The CCL bonds are far more polar than the CH bonds. So although it's tetrahedral, because all four bonds are not identical, this will still be a, this will be a polar molecule. So this will be a polar molecule. So it's really just look out for those perfect tetrahedral molecules where the polarity cancels out. The one other case that you come across where the polarity cancels out is in carbon dioxide, whereas because of the C double bond O, it takes up this linear structure. And although uh, in each case the oxygen uh, is more electronegative than the carbon, because the polarities are acting in opposite directions, they cancel out. So a molecule will be polar if it contains polar bonds. The only time a molecule containing polar bonds will not be polar is if you've got the perfect tetrahedral or carbon dioxide. Right, you should be able to understand how London dispersion forces, permanent dipole, permanent dipole interactions and hydrogen bonding arise and understand these are all types of van der Waals forces. Okay, so everything we're going to talk about here can be described as being a van der Waals force. So, van der Waals forces cover all your intermolecular forces and the forces of attraction you get between monatomic elements, in other words, the noble gases. Okay, so it's all the, the attraction between the noble gases and the attraction between molecules. Now, the attraction between the atoms and the noble gases are LDF, London Dispersion Forces. We've explained in a previous lecture how they arise. Uh, temporary dipole set up by the uneven distribution of the electrons whizzing around the atoms. When we look at uh, molecules, all molecules polar or non-polar will have London dispersion forces. Okay. 
so all molecules will have London dispersion forces. However, if the molecule is polar, it will also have another intermolecular force. Uh, so it could have permanent dipole, permanent dipole interactions, or it may also have hydrogen bonding. Now, both PDPD -PD and hydrogen bonding are very similar. Let's uh, look at PDPD -PD for a second. So imagine we've got two molecules of hydrogen chloride. It's a polar molecule. And the chlorine atom is slightly negative. The hydrogen is slightly positive. Now, the permanent dipole, permanent dipole interaction is the electrostatic attraction between the positive end of this molecule and the negative end of this molecule. Okay, so that attraction there is your PD PD. So, very similar to the LDF, only it's permanent. Remember, the LDF the dipoles were temporary. Here, a hydrogen chloride molecule. That side, if it's always going to be slightly positive, that side's always going to be slightly negative. So the di electrostatic attraction between the two molecules is permanent. So that's permanent dipole, permanent dipole. Hydrogen bonding is very similar to this, only a lot stronger. And you only get it if the molecule contains an OH bond, for example, in water or I think of uh, unit 2 in organic chemistry on alcohols or an NH bond which you get in ammonia or in proteins and it's very important for determining the shape of proteins okay. or in the molecule HF hydrogen fluoride that also has hydrogen bonding Okay, I'll just say so. If your molecule is non polar, then LDF is the major intermolecular force. But if it's polar, it will have LDF and either PDPD -PD or hydrogen bonding. Right, I can relate physical properties such as melting and boiling points, viscosity, and solubility to the type of intermolecular forces present in the molecule. Right, so we've got these three different types of intermolecular forces. LDF is the weakest, then you get PDPD, and then hydrogen bonding. So how does that relate to the melting and boiling point of molecules? Well, if you're trying to melt or boil a molecular substance, the thing is to remember, you're not trying to break the covalent bonds within the molecule, you're breaking the intermolecular forces between the molecules. So as that intermolecular force increases, you will need more energy to break the bond, and so the melting and boiling points increase as you go from LDF to PDPD to hydrogen bonding. Just worth mentioning, of course, if you're comparing the melting boiling points of two non-polar molecules which only have LDF the bigger molecule the heavier molecule will have a stronger LDF so for example H2 little light molecule small LDF very low melting boiling points whereas say oxygen O2 slightly bigger stronger LDF so it will have a slightly higher melting boiling point and same when it comes down to hydrogen bonding the more hydrogen bonds in the molecule the stronger the intermolecular force so for example simple alcohols with uh, say methanol or ethanol got one OH group they'll have one hydrogen bond whereas water it's got two OH bonds and then you've got glycerol it's got three OH bonds so again, more OH bonds, the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the melting or boiling point. 
viscosity remember that's how uh, thick a liquid is so like treacle or honey can be a very viscous liquid and the viscosity increases with the strength of the intermolecular force so we tend to see it increasing you did do an experiment to measure it into well to get a measure of viscosity of different elements or different molecules can i just remind you of that because sometimes it, you get you get asked about this so got two tubes here one containing methanol one containing water methanol one hydrogen bond water two hydrogen bonds and there's a little air bubble in here so if i turn it over you see the air bubble going up the tube that was the methanol i do the same with the water you see the air bubble going up far more slowly because it's a more viscous material so that's one way of measuring the viscosity of the liquids it's just coming to the top now okay so just a little reminder of how you go about measuring the viscosity and finally how does the intermolecular force affect the solubility in water okay so water remember is a very polar solvent we know that like dissolves like so a polar solvent will dissolve a polar substance so the polarity increases as you go from here to here so the solubility in water increases as you go from LDF to hydrogen bonding in this diagram I have a bit solubility in a non-polar solvent that would go the other way around if it's a non-polar solvent uh, the non-polar molecules the LDF ones would be more pol more soluble than the very polar hydrogen bonding molecules I can draw diagrams to show hydrogen bonding between molecules okay so here's two molecules of ethanol so this the OH bond gives rise to the hydrogen bonding making the oxygen slightly negative the hydrogen slightly positive same thing here so sometimes it's quite common to be asked to draw a dotted line to show the hydrogen bonding between the two molecules so remember the hydrogen bonding is attached between the negative part of one molecule and the positive part of the other molecule so it's going to go from the oxygen of one ethanol molecule to the hydrogen of the other ethanol molecule not any old hydrogen but the hydrogen on the OH bond so if you draw a dotted line like that and it'd be okay just to draw the one or you could draw two okay either would be acceptable and finally it says i can relate hydrogen bonding water to its density when solid and liquid i want to extend that a wee bit and maybe just look at the general strange properties of water brought about by the hydrogen bonding so we've got the negative oxygen positive hydrogens so and it's two hydrogen bonds in the water molecule and properties that gives rise to well it means it's a very polar molecule so it's got a surprisingly high melting and boiling point uh, far higher than you expect from a little molecule with a mass of 18 okay it's got a relatively high viscosity we tend not to think of water as being quite viscous because we're so used to it but uh, certainly compared with things like methanol with one OH bond uh, it has got quite a high viscosity it's got a low density when solid which means that ice floats on water which is very unusual normally solids are denser than the liquids and its density when solid is so low 
because as you freeze it, the hydrogen bonding locks it into this very open structure which has got very large gaps so the water molecules are not packed together very closely uh, so it makes it a very low density material and finally water is miscible with polar liquids so what does miscible mean it means it doesn't form two layers mixed together well almost it's, it's the solubility of the polar liquid in the polar water so if you add ethanol to water for example in a glass of wine you don't get two layers they mix together and the opposite is true they are immiscible but non-polar liquids that means they don't mix together and they form two separate layers as you see here if you mix oil and water oil is non-polar water is polar they don't mix they form two immiscible layers and we'll come back to this in unit two when we look at using emulsifiers to get these two immiscible liquids to mix